shall I start by saying hello and welcome to you all to this discussion and question and answer on some of the issues raised in the film. I'm Sean Kevill, one of the executive producers of the documentary, but we're delighted you've joined us and hope you're enjoying the screening so far. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel to dynamic women from different ends of Africa. Inamuja, who you've just seen in the film and who's here to discuss her journey and experiences of making the documentary. And Reverend Mpu Tutu Van Furt, the daughter of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his wife, Norma Liesel Tutu, and both co-founders of Desmond Tutu Peace Center. Mpu has followed in her father's footsteps as a priest, but is also a writer, theologian, and a fighter for improving the lives of women and girls. Now, if you have questions for them, please use the chat facility, which you will see either on the bottom of your screen or to the side of your screen or somewhere, but send us uh, questions. Um, I'll be back on Zoom uh, a little later to put a selection of those questions to our guests. But in the meantime, can I hand over to Inna? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Reverend Po, to be with us. It's a great honor for me. Uh, before we start, I wanted to ask you a question. I wanted to have your reaction to the documentary. What gave you the strongest impression? Did anything surprise you after watching the film? Um, I think um, the thing that, that really um, stayed with me after watching the film, there were, there were lots of things that really stayed with me. Um, your music is beautiful. Um, your spirit is is really enchanting. Um, I was really touched by the stories that the girls told you, the, um, the, the girls who had been abducted by Boko Haram. Yes. Um, and I was really struck by the shrinking of Lake Chad and you know how huge the impact of climate change has already been on the region so you know a 90 percent shrinkage is that's incredible yes and in just 50 years time so it's pretty wow. much uh, it's very fast and yes. it's really scary yes well what well, well what what was most striking for you about your journey? What is it that really stays with you? I had a lot of moments and I feel like a lot of the people that we met, their stories are still here on my shoulders. I think a lot about them. I think about the young girls at the orphanage uh, who, whose parents have been killed by Boko Haram and, uh, and also the young people who were abducted, the girl and the boy because in the beginning, I was really surprised when I was hearing the boy talking. And I felt a little bit of anger at some point because he was talking about the people he had killed and he was saying that smiling. And so automatically I had like a kind of uh, reaction. And then speaking with Amsatu and listening to him, I realized that he was abducted at nine years old and, uh, and brainwashed. And he and the girl are actually two face of the same medal and that they are both victims. And hearing a young boy of 16 years old say that the first people who taught him anything was Boko Haram, mm. for me, that was something really difficult to hear. And I realized that uh, society had failed him mm. because having an armed group teach our young people anything that is really, really difficult for me. And I still think about them a lot. Yeah, were there, were there things that, um, that stayed with you that maybe didn't make it into the film? There is this amazing man called Musa Si. He lives in Senegal and uh, he lives in Koili Alpha. And his story is so powerful, I really, wish that one day we can also share his story because he's this old man in the middle of the desert of the Sahel in Senegal and he's such a feminist. He fights for his granddaughters, he wants them, he created a school in mm. the middle of the desert and uh, his daughters, they all speak 
Fulani, they speak another Senegalese language, they speak French and English, and they are incredible. These kids have so much ambition and they see themselves as um, they can be lawyers, doctors, or they see that they can achieve anything. And that's the education that he's been giving him. He's been given his family. So for me, his story was really powerful, but I, I understand why it didn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, there were so many beautiful stories that we couldn't fit all in a one hour and a half film, but hopefully one day his story will be told. Well, you've, you've told it here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a blessing and a gift. Thank you. The mm -hmm. film highlights the impacts of climate change in the Sahel. And uh, Paul, I wanted to ask you, do you think that COVID-19 crisis will change anything and will people care more about tackling uh, climate change now? Wow. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I certainly hope so. Um, I, I think that um, the one thing about climate change has been all of the way along, we have been setting these really um, unambitious goals for tackling the climate crisis um, and saying, you know, these unambitious goals where as much as we can do, we can't do more because it will destroy our economies we can't do more because it'll put people out of work. We can't do more because, because, because. And then along comes a COVID-19 crisis and we mm -hmm. discover that um, actually we don't have to fly here, there and everywhere. We don't have to um, even go out of our houses and go to work. Um, and, and you know many of the things that, that had sounded so impossible um, before COVID, we suddenly realize actually really are possible. And it's just a lack of will on our part. And so, you know, the, the, the way that children and young people have been standing and protesting, um, you know, before COVID um, about what they wanted to see happening in terms of climate change. Now, um, those in positions of power and leadership in the world don't have a leg to stand on in terms of saying, oh, you know, what it is that we can't do, that we daren't do, that, that will put our economies or whatever at risk. And so I, I, I hope um, that, that we continue to hold the feet of those in power to the fire and say, yes. you know, you could shut down everything on a dime because you thought your lives were at risk. Um, you as older people thought your lives are at risk. Um, we, who are the young people who are going to live with this climate crisis, are going to yeah. live with the consequences of climate change, are now saying, "Do the same for us. Um, do the same for do the same for this next generation that's going to live with the consequences of what you have or you haven't done." Yes. And you know, I mean, uh, we you know, we see with with COVID how. Um, the impact is felt the most by the poorest um, and the most vulnerable in that way. Um, yes. and, and climate change is, is the same. It is kind of the new place where the, the poorest and the most vulnerable are going to be the first ones who are affected um, by climate change. Absolutely. And I was going to say your father, Archbishop Tutu, has spoken a lot about uh, climate change and justice. And uh, a few years ago, he said that the most devastating effects of climate change are being visited on the world's poor and Africans who emit far less carbon than the people of any other continent will pay the steepest price. And it is a deep injustice. And um, do you think that now with this crisis, people really realize how big the problem is? Oh. I would hope so, but I, I'm not, um, I'm not so sure and not so sanguine um, that that we don't just 
kind of look at our own little lives and yes. and think about our own little lives and not think about the the society as a whole or our um or or the whole planet as um as being um so deeply interwoven that what happens yes. in one on one place in one place on the planet really does as you said the the butterfly effect yeah the yes um, l'effet papillon l'effet papillon yeah. absolutely <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. yes it's uh i during the filming and also traveling in africa i really feel that uh the butterfly effect is present because mm -hmm. I heard a lot of people say the same thing as you and your father are saying, that we in Africa are the ones who uh, are less contributing to climate change and we are really suffering the effects and uh, more, more viciously, more violently than any other uh, Western uh, society. So today with internet, we see a lot of young people connected to the world. They know everything that's happening in, around the world and young people want the same things. And uh, this new generation, they are ready to fight for, for it's, it's so empowering and it gives me so much hope to see them in the streets marching and really demanding a change for the climate, for racial um, equality, for fairness and a different lifestyle. And um, you and I are both passionate about women and girls' rights. I know that you are working uh, to promote girls through mentorship. And uh, could you tell us more about it? Um, yeah, so um, one of the things that, um, that, that my wife and I have um, been working on is the project is an international mentoring project for, um, for women um, not girls, uh, just because we want over, um, women over the age of 18 um, okay. to be able to access somebody who will um, help them to realize their professional and career dreams. Um, because we know that people who are mentored are much more likely to achieve success and achieve it earlier to stay in the career roles um, yes. that that um, that they they enter into to to in, to take to get much more job satisfaction in whatever work it is that they find but women are also much less likely to be mentored than our men and yes. women of color of any color are much less likely to be mentored than um, than white men. So white men will almost invariably be the first ones who who are in line for a mentor. And so through our platform, we um, match women with um, with women in the profession that they want to enter into. Or, in, or the profession that they're in so that they can be mentored through that process. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. It's um, during times of crisis and uh, uh, women and girls are the most vulnerable. And uh, even during, even when everything is going right. Oh. Yes. So it's- <laughs> Women uh, and girls are still the most yes, vulnerable. It's the most vulnerable. So, and African women are even more vulnerable again. So uh, that is such an exciting and inspiring project. Thank you. And I, you know, I mean, I think that one of the things that you were um, also able to showcase being a, um, a, 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 a powerful African woman in your own right, um, but as you went through your journey, um, the, the number of um, powerful and impactful African women who you who you encountered and who you spoke with, um, like at every point there was um, a, a, a woman who was showing leadership, who was growing her community, who was yes. growing this great green wall uh, yes. that, that we want to see spread across the whole continent. And uh, 
to me, it was something beautiful to see how involved women are with the Great Green Wall in the communities, with the planting process, taking care of the gardens, taking care of all the, all the process and uh, working together. And that is something that gives me a lot of hope because I know that they will do it, they will do it right. And uh, they are, um, in French, we say socle, they are a foundation for their community. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I truly believe that this project has to be achieved and to come to completion because it is going to help so many communities all along the way. And uh, after watching the film and knowing about this project, how do you think that as African, we can come together and make this Great Green Wall become a reality? And uh, how can this Great Green Wall benefit all of Africa, not just the Sahel? Well, just, um, just by the simple fact of coming into existence, um, if we are able to grow this Great Green Wall um, just by the fact of having a great green wall there. It benefits the whole of Africa, not just the Sahel. It benefits the whole world um, because number one, trees create their own climate. Um, yes. that, that, you know, trees are the lungs of the planet. Um, in this time of COVID, we have seen um, in many places, the planet recovering um, from the excesses that we subjected it to. But in some places, like in Brazil, there's that, you know, it's been the opportunity for clear cutting in the Amazon rainforest, um, yes. which means that we're, we're, we're creating lung damage um, for, for the whole world. And so the Great Green Wall um, can be a balance to offset the lung damage that we're creating all over the world um, is, is, is one thing. Um, the, the, the second is that um, you, you have shown as you go through that journey um, how much the wall benefits um, uh, uh, communities, it provides work in communities, it provides um, a resource for, uh, for um, an, an economic resource for communities, yes. is a way to stave off this refugee crisis, it's a way to stave off the crisis of migration where people are leaving in search of work. Um, most people would rather stay home. Most people would rather be in their home country if they could. Um, they only leave because they think that there is nothing for them where they are and, and the Great Green Wall would create um, opportunities for people in Africa, to remain in Africa, um, and to build up Africa as uh, you know, as the as the um, continent that has been so devastated, um, not only by war, but by the ravages of colonialism, by the ravages of slave trade, by the ravages that have you know for absolutely centuries. Um, oops, sorry, I, I, no, I'm not up. Um, for centuries, the, the African continent has been, um, ravaged and I'm having some technical difficulties here, so. There, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I needed some tech support. My my screen um, disappeared, um, and and all of those things, the Great Green Wall can answer for us. Um, one of the things that we've we've also been doing, you you might know, my parents um, just celebrated sixty five years of marriage. Um, wow! And... Congratulations! <laughs> that is so amazing. A long time. God bless them. <laughs> Thank wow. you. But, you know, one of the things that, that we're wanting to do for them is to um, is to plant 6,500 trees on wow. the Great Green Wall 
as as an anniversary gift to them because wow at 65 years you probably don't need any more plates or teaspoons <laughs> oh yes hello okay i'm here sorry i'm back i think i also had some technical difficulties <laughs> the joys of zoom <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely this is where i think i will uh, magically reappear on the feed <laughs> and uh, i thought i'd come back anyway so we've got some questions which the audience has uh, um, sent in to us so i thought i'd, I'd just throw them to you um, and you know obviously keep keep everything going as well so I just wanted to, I suppose there were a number of people have just said bravo. Um, Robert Bissett said bravo, inspirational film. Um, he wanted to know what more the international community could uh, do to spread the word on the important messages in the film. And I'll add in also uh, one from Michael Radka who said it's just such an inspiring story and the power of journeys of discovery was on full display. I wonder how we can capture and deliver the power for all people with a smaller ecological footprint. So uh, maybe, I mean, wh whoever wants to grab one of those first, maybe it's about getting the, it, it, the important messages of the film out there. Can the international community help? Can it help other um, communities with a small ecological footprint? Should uh, I go? Yeah, go on, Anna, you go. Well, I think uh, by supporting the project, by sharing about the project and let um, everybody know about it. This is something that is really going to help. I think the more people get behind this kind of project, the more it's going to happen. And um, one of the challenges that uh, the Great Green Wall is facing is the lack of um, foundings. And this is something that uh, not just Africa is will be able to, to achieve, but also private sectors and uh, foundations and, uh, and governments. And this is something that we really need to, to, to be doing because it costs money. But in the end, it's something that is going to save millions of lives and uh, livelihoods and uh, prevent all the difficult issues that the Sahel is facing right now. Like Paul, uh, Reverend Paul was saying, uh, migration, food security and uh, also having the land degradation that is happening right now that is faster than what we are doing to prevent climate change. So I think uh, on the site we have a lot of different steps that we people can follow and join the movement because we need to make this a movement for it to uh, really happen and make it a reality. And, and Pope. Oh, I, I will, I'll just second what Ina has said that she and has said so well um, and, and say, you know, and, and really underline the last point that it really does have to be a movement. It can't, um, it can't just be a single campaign. Um, it has to be a movement and it's not, uh, it's not a tree planting campaign. It is actually a tree growing campaign, which means that it can't be an investment for one moment. Um, and, and once the trees are planted, we're done. But actually, but actually needing to, to, um, to help the communities to be able to continue to grow the trees, um, to, to look after them um, so that it's, it, it does become a sustained and sustainable forest. Wonderful. I've but another message from Charlotte and Alan Webner Pedersen who say blessings and thank you so much. And we look forward to supporting the project, which is, is, which is great news. And then maybe one for Inna, which is um, really about whether you think music can be a, a driving force to tackle world issues. Well, I think uh, musicians have been using their voices and music to share um, the messages and also the issues they strongly believe in. And uh, I think music is a way, we are not politicians. We, we are not uh, looking to be elected or we are just sharing something we are passionate about. And I think um, it touches people in another way 
art and culture touches people in another way that politics doesn't. And uh, it, it's close to the heart. And I think that with music, we can share the messages from the uh, hardest to the softest. And um, that's what I've been doing for, since I've started my career is uh, we can share stories, we can uh, amplify voices of people who are kind of voiceless and uh, use our platform to shed light on, um, on issues. And hopefully uh, um, this is not something that I invented. It, it has been done for ages, but films uh, like this using music uh, to, to share you know, soci societal issues it's something that is going to continue. Mm. And, and I suppose I, I, I could jump in here and <laughs> ask him about something, which is, you know, you're a priest. So what role do you think religion or religious communities can play in engaging people, communities, and, uh, and helping people to embrace projects like the Great Green Wall? Well, the, um, the ecology is very much, uh, a religious issue and an issue of faith um, that uh, those of us who are people of faith who um, believe in a God who created all that is um, also have a responsibility to care for what has been created to care for God's creation um, and um, and so that that ecological consciousness um, is is something that is central to our belief system. It's not a peripheral issue. Um, it is absolutely central, and particularly to to those of the Abrahamic faiths um, who you know who kind of who who, who look back to the you know the beginning of our texts is God making creation, um, God calling creation into being, and and seeing that what God has created is good. And I'm just going to pick up another. Oh, question. I, uh, I didn't finish. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't finish answering your question. I just remembered that there was a tag. And so for religious and faith communities, um, this is absolutely. Um, uh, 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 um, a movement of which they can very readily be a part and very readily sign on for. Um, that that as, as faith and religious communities learn more about the Great Green Wall, um, this is absolutely something that they can support um, with, with people power and with um, financial resources. Uh, brilliant. I, I, I've got one other question that's, I'm not, I, I'm not sure you'll be able to answer this, but it comes from Tom Beach uh, for both of you. Um, how will organising in each region for planting, education and employment, how, how will it take place? Can you, Do you want to go in a bit? Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear well. Let me, let me try one more time. This is from uh, Tom Beach, who asks both of you, um, how will organizing in each region for planting education and employment, how will it take place? What are the benefits? Well, so, do you want me to go ahead? Uh, yeah. yeah. Go on in, you, you go first. Well, I think education is really important because if we want to form the next generation to be leaders, and, uh, and also the regions where the Great Green Wall is being planted in the Sahel, it, it is very difficult regions, and, uh, but people also need education there. It's not because you live in these areas that you have to, um, to suffer from, uh, um, how do you say that? I'm thinking in French and <laughs> Portuguese right now. So I think, as we all know, education is the key to success. Education is really something growing up in the Sahel, my parents, uh, we were not rich, but something that my parents gave us is education and faith and, uh, and believing in us. And this is something that everybody needs to move forward. And the next generation, we want our future leaders to not be uh, walking kilometers every day, one hour to go and get water or 
you know, go and feed the, the, the animals. We want them to be in school and to be able to lead Africa. And uh, this is something that for the past 20, 30 years have been campaigning all over Africa that they need to put young boys and young, young girls specifically uh, in school because it's something that is important. And also employment, the Great Green Wall, as uh, Reverend Poe was saying, is not just planting, it's growing. So it's kind of, the project uh, is creating job opportunities for people uh, in the region and, uh, and also uh, combating, uh, how do you say that, food insecurity. So this is all tied together in the project. The first idea of the project when it started in 2007 and is completely different from what it is right now. So it is uh, a more sustainable project and it's really tackling different issues and education, employment and food security are part of it. And, and it, you know, as we saw in the film, um, well, two things that we saw in the film. Um, one was how whole communities are drawn into um, um, into the the planting and forest management um, efforts, so that it's not it's not an individual, but it is a whole community enterprise. Um, and once it becomes a whole community enterprise, in order for, well, for, in order for it to become a whole community enterprise, the, the community needs to have an understanding of what it is that they are doing and why. Yes. And so that's part of that, that education that goes along with the, the growing of that Great Green Wall. And, and because um, it is a, a project of the African Union um, that has both the um, macro level organizational skills, but then there's also the community based organization that is going on around um, this growing of the wall and we saw some of those communities um, in the film, um, and if you um, yeah, if you go to our website, we also have, we have a, one of the community organizations that's working with, with growing um, uh, trees along the wall as well. Uh, I've got a question here from, I think, a friend of yours, John Mullen, um, who, uh, oh no. Don't know him. It's actually for Empo. He says, tell us more about the Bebab Forest, your family and friends are growing on the Great Green Wall for your parents' 65th wedding anniversary. So I, oh, yes. I did say something about that um, a little earlier on, um, uh, saying that that um, my, as I said, my parents had cele had celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary, and as our gift for them, we're inviting people to help us to grow a baobab forest on the Great Green Wall. Um, and a baobab forest, number one, because it, it is um, um, endemic to the region, um, but it also because it is a, a, a food product and is a saleable product as well, a marketable product as well. Um, and, and so we're wanting to grow 6,500 baobabs um, as, as part of, of the contribution in honor of my parents' marriage on, this, on the Great Green Wall. And if you go to um, tututeach.org, um, you can donate there to help us in, in um, planting and growing um, this forest. And I, and, I, and I do want to be really deliberate in saying growing the forest, not just planting it. Um, so we're actually supporting a community to continue to grow these trees. Yeah. And you know, I suppose just picking up on that, uh, mention the baobab, how, how important is it to grow indigenous plants and trees along the Great Green Wall from you know, what you discovered? Well, what was really interesting is that um, the, it's not just planting trees for planting trees, it's planting trees with a purpose. And uh, as Reverend Poe was saying, the baobab has fruits and it's sellable. And there are other uh, plant, uh, other trees like the acacia and uh, shea and different kinds of trees that will help also the region to become uh, an economic um, uh, partner for the rest of the world. 
And so people will be able to, to trade what they will plant all along the Great Green Wall. And this is something that for me was really interesting to know because it generates, uh, it generates money. It's not just about planting tree to help the, the desert, to help stop the desert. It is also to uh, make these communities real commercial partners to the West. Uh, I've got one, one more from Brian uh, Rush or Rush. Um, it's slightly more for me, but because I'm in the wonderful position of asking the questions, I can put it to you, which is uh, how can we help others see this amazing film and use it as a tool to help support the Great Green Wall project? Do you want me to answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna ask the same question myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also have the same question. I think um, the film is in cinemas right now in France and uh, it was supposed to be released in, in a lot of countries in Europe and also in Africa and in America. But uh, I, I, I think you should answer, Sean. I, I don't really know. <laughs> well, it, it, it hopefully it will be available in, in good cinemas uh, near many people around the globe in, in, in well, in the next, COVID permitting in, in the next six months or, or, or maybe up to nine months or so. So I suppose that's the answer. Um, but uh, I suppose there was one other question which I got, which was, uh, for, you know, what was the most inspiring project you saw I saw a lot of inspiring projects and I saw a lot of inspiring people because to me, uh, the project is really ambitious as a whole, the Great Green Wall, but the people that I met uh, gave me faith that it's possible. And uh, in Ethiopia, when I met Abahawi, I was so stunned by the work that his community has achieved in the past 20 years. And uh, seeing the images of uh, you know, we, we've all seen the images of Ethiopia during the, the, the horrible uh, famines. It's very emotional for me to think about that. And um, so when I was going to uh, the region of Tigray, I was very anxious because I, it was my first time traveling to Ethiopia, even though I read a lot about it. I couldn't believe what I saw when I arrived because the region was so green that if anybody had told me so, I wouldn't have believed it because we've been, uh, um, the images that we saw in the media for the past you know, decades has been very tough to see. So knowing that this man with the inspiration and with the leadership that he had, he convinced his community to give 40 days every year to plant, grow trees, and to also help with uh, uh, keeping the rainwater. And really, they, they, it's, you saw in the film how I was speechless. It was really, for me, it was the proof that we can make this. It's not just a, a crazy project. I mean, uh, the man has, humankind has went to the moon we can plant and grow trees. We can really help reverse the effects of that climate change is having in the Sahel right now. And we can have these communities in the Sahel thrive instead of just surviving as they have been doing for the past decades. And uh, so for me, this Ethiopia, but I know that there are other projects in Kenya, in Burkina Faso, and in different places that we haven't shown in the film that are really inspiring. And uh, as far as the Great Green Wall, Senegal has, uh, they are really, really far ahead of a lot of countries. And uh, hopefully uh, all the rest of the countries that are part of the Great Green Wall will follow into their footsteps. And uh, uh, we are 10 years away from uh, the completion of the Great Green Wall. So to me, this is something that, uh, the people that I've met, I know that they can make it happen. I know that we can make it happen together because it's something that we have to come together to, to do. Actually, that, well, I want to ask you something, about, which is obviously, you know, when you think about the Great Green Wall, but, you know, from your experience in, in South Africa, I mean, what brings people together? What, and what divides them and what brings them together to achieve something like this from your experiences there? What, what, do you, what advice could you give us? 
or hope could you give us? Uh, I, I think that that um, what what brings people together um, uh, is is either running away from a negative vision or running towards a positive vision. Um, and if you have both, if you have something negative for people to run away from and something positive that you can point to, um, then, you, then you offer them the impetus to really get involved and to stick with it. And in this instance, we absolutely have um, the, the terror of drought and famine and war um, that so many people have experienced um, and continue to experience now. And we have the positive vision of, um, of a Tigre that, 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 ch that changed from being the site of war and famine to being this um, green oasis. Um, that, that people can look towards and say, oh, this is also possible for us. That's wonderful. Now, I, I think we are sort of coming to an end now. Um, so what I'd love to do is maybe to have one final thought from, from each of you, um, you know, a, a little thought to, to wrap up. So maybe, I don't mind which one, <laughs> whoever wants to jump in first. I will let you start, Reverend. Oh, um, as a, a final thought um, is that this is such an achievable dream. Um, it is a, a dream in which each one of us can participate and can make a real difference, not only for um, Africa, but for the planet as a whole, um, that, that with um, growing this great green wall, we um, offer opportunities for the kind of life that we yearn for, for all of our children. And this for children in Africa, but for children in Europe as well. The Great Green Wall gives, is, is, a, is like a lung transplant for our planet. We must do this. We must. Ina. I would like to, to thank Reverend Paul for joining us. It was such a great honor. And uh, you and your family are so inspiring. And to have you take some time to talk with us and uh, be so encouraging for me, this is something that is um, really uh, emotional for me. I hope that young people are going to get the opportunities that they deserve, young African, uh, because you were born in Africa doesn't mean that you are less than other, that you deserve less. And hopefully we will make Africa a continent that is thriving and we'll, we will have communities really um, not have to, to flee or to survive on a daily basis. We need a continent to be hopeful and to create this African dream. And uh, for me, having the support of Reverend Poe and your family, uh, I'm really hopeful that we, we can make this together and um, you all have achieved so much already. And um, I'm just, I'm really humbled. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> I just want to thank both of you just for a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. And we're so grateful that you, you both found the time to come along and, and participate. And of course, we would give our deep thanks as well to Archbishop Tutu, who, although he couldn't be here, um, sent that wonderful introduction with his wise words and his, his inspiration. Um, I suppose this screening was organised by Make Waves, my production company, and it was done in partnership with a truly forward thinking uh, social enterprise uh, organization called Civic. And we're also grateful to all of our supporters, um, some of whom are in the audience tonight who made this film happen. And I hope everyone has enjoyed this event, but I have to reiterate that it doesn't have to end here. Please do visit the Great Green Wall website to find out more about the project, 
and how to join the movement for change. The website address is at the top of this web page on the right hand side. Um, as we said a little bit earlier, the, the film is rolling out across the globe in the coming months. So keep your eyes peeled in case uh, the, the release happens in your respective countries and do encourage people to go. I think it's actually opening in Canada next week. Obviously we already know it's been um, available in France. I have to say finally that we see this film as a powerful launch pad to shine a spotlight on one of the greatest undertakings of our time, dubbed by many as a, a, a new world wonder in the making. Um, our ambition with this film is to spark a movement to urgently ramp up action to complete the wall by 2030. And if you're interested in speaking to us about how to take part or how to help, we'd love to keep talking to you after this event. So in the hope that you will lend your support to this incredibly and truly important uh, project, it just remains for me to say thank you. And thank you again to Ina Mpo for such a great discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, from all of us, uh, goodbye. Thank you.